when we talked about buffers in the last section, we used uh, buffers and we talked about the common ion effect, how you can use the addition of the uh, conjugate to understand changes to pH and stuff like that. Well, we can use the common ion effect here with solubility as well. And this is a really kind of interesting phenomenon. If you look down in the lower left hand side, uh, the kind of test tube, really a centrifuge tube on the left there, it has some silver acetate, which is made up of Ag plus and acetate CH3CO2 minus ions. And the solid is right here. But because this is a solubility, you also have the ions. So you can see how there's acetates and silvers kind of floating around on the top there. All right, no big deal. Well, let's say that we decide to add extra silver nitrate, okay? Now, silver nitrate is not really part of the Ag acetate kind of equilibrium, all right, per se. But the silver in silver nitrate is a common ion to the silver acetate equilibrium, okay? So as you add more silver, you can notice there how on the first picture on the left, you had one, two, three acetates in solution kind of running around. And then right here, it shows adding the additional silver nitrate. And then finally, on the right-hand side, notice, and this is not an accident, there's only one acetate left over. So adding silver to a silver nitrate or silver acetate equilibrium forced the reaction to move towards the solid side and more silver acetate precipitated out. So at the end, you end up, first of all, with less acetate. There were three ions of acetate. Now there's only one, okay? The silver ions, roughly about the same, maybe a little bit larger. But you also end up with a new counter ion, in this case, nitrate. Now, why this is important is that if you have some kind of nasty ion in solution that you need to get out, precipitating it out with some kind of a common ion is a very, a very cool thing to do, all right? It gets the bad ion out of solution and you end up with more solid. And remember, solids you can filter out um, pretty easily and they're easier to ship away for waste containers and stuff. But in the process, you do end up adding additional, another kind of ion. Now, probably, Nitrate is more benign than acetate, all right? Nitrate is pH neutral, as we saw in the last section, while acetate actually has a slight basic idea, a basic function. So maybe it's good to, to um, exchange, if you will, nitrate ions uh, for acetate ions. So the acetate goes into the solid form and you can precipitate that out. But you can't get something for nothing. And that's another thing I wanna point out. You may have lost acetate ions here, but now you have have a bunch of nitrates running around and maybe that's good maybe it's bad it's something you just have to realize as you go through this stuff in the test tube is a solution containing lead ions to this we add a solution containing chloride ions and lead chloride precipitates solid lead chloride is in equilibrium with lead ions and chloride ions in solution at this point we add more chloride ions in the form of a sodium chloride solution which disturbs the equilibrium. More lead chloride precipitates, which removes still more lead ions from solution. So in this video, which I like a lot, by the way, we're thinking about getting rid of lead ions. And lead in the 70s especially was seen as a really bad metal. <laughs> Apparently it's a little bit sweet when you eat it. People made paint out of it. Little kids would eat the paint because it was sweet and tasty. Long story short, and the paint's no longer no, no longer supposed to anyway have lead. But anyway, neither, neither here nor there. Let's say we have a lead 2 plus solution and we're trying to get the lead out of solution, okay? Well, what we're doing is we're adding essentially sodium chloride solutions to the lead okay now as you add a chloride source chloride from sodium chloride is an ion common to this equilibrium chloride is a product so adding chloride shifts the reaction to the reactant side the side with the solid and in the process you can see the lead concentration goes from a higher value to a less high value the lead is being pushed into the pbcl2 and that's what the top graph here is that's showing you the pbcl2 that's precipitating and after the first 
first chloride addition, you definitely have PBCL2 precipitating out. Your lead ion is less, but notice now we do have chloride. And even though it doesn't state it, we also have sodium ions, which is probably okay, but still. Now, if you really want to get that lead out, heck yeah, add another P, uh, NaCl solution. And that's what then this last part is right here. Well, additional NaCl adds more chloride. And like we saw earlier, more chloride makes the reaction go to the reactant side. Lead ion concentration is as low as it is anywhere. In the process, though, now we do have more chloride, all right? Because again, this is equilibrium and the chloride is pushing the lead out, but of course then you end up with more chloride. The PBCL2 is easy to get out. We'll precipitate that, filter it, whatever, get rid of it. There would be sodium ions. So common ion effect can be really useful for getting out specific ions. If you do it right, like in this case, you can really get out the bad stuff, all right? On the other hand, in the process then, you end up adding different kinds of ions. In this case, like chlorides or sodiums and stuff like that. So it is an a perfect system, but it can be really useful when you have an ion you really want to get out of solution. Let's calculate the solubility of barium sulfate in pure water and also when there's some barium present, okay? Now, barium sulfate in pure water, no big deal. There's the KSP for barium sulfate, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10th. So this will be a problem like we looked at earlier when we convert a KSP into solubility. You can see that bar one barium ion and one sulfate ion come from every barium sulfate. So that's like an x times x or x squared. So this is an x squared equals KSP. We can solve for the solubility that way. The second part though will be a little bit more interesting because we have barium already present. Barium is a common ion to the barium sulfate KSP expression. And if you think about having a barium sulfate KSP expression and you start adding in some barium, well barium ion is a product it's going to shift the reaction to the left side. We'll see how this affects solubility here in a little bit. But let's get rid of the first part first. The solubility, like I said, is oftentimes represented as X. You can represent it as anything you want to. And that solubility literally is the moles of barium sulfate that dissolve per liter in order to make a solid. But because it's one to one with barium ions and sulfate ions, barium ions equals sulfate ions equals solubility. And again, to find solubility, take the square root of that KSP, square root of 1.1 times 10 to the minus minus 10th, x value 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. So we would say that the solubility of barium sulfate in pure water, if we put literally barium sulfate right in pure water, solubility 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. So as long as we put in less than 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of barium sulfate per liter, no solid. But that's a pretty small number. It'll probably be easy to get over 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter, then we'll start seeing a solid. And it's easy to get bigger than 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter, so yeah, we'll see barium sulfate pretty readily. This is a one-to-one -one ratio of cation to anion, one barium, one sulfate, so x times x, x squared equals KSP, etc, etc. We'll see a lot of x squared equals KSP for one-to-ones. We'll also see some 4x cubed equals KSP expressions when you have two anions and one cation, or two cations, one anion. Now, for the second part, the solubility in the pure water, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. In the second part, though, we've already got some barium. You can also think about this problem as you have the pure water and you're adding barium ions to it. Well, if you think about it that way, you're adding a product. You're adding barium ions. We would predict that adding barium is going to move the reaction to the left-hand side, to the side with the precipitate. That means that you're going to have a harder time getting things to go into solution, all right? So down the bottom, which way will the common ion shift the equilibrium, i.e. you're adding barium, a product, it's gonna shift to the opposite direction. We would expect a shift to the left, to the reactant side. 
Now, if you shift to the left, that means that less barium sulfate will be dissolving into barium and sulfate ions. So we would predict that the solubility of the barium sulfate will be less in the barium solution than it is in pure water. You can think about it like if there's already barium there, the barium is less likely to break away from barium sulfate. All right, there's already things there. But we can do this. We can actually figure this out using some pretty simple math. We can make an ice table, all right? And for this one, barium and sulfate are the only things in the ice table. We don't put solids or liquids. Barium sulfate, again, is a solid. Now, we initially have some barium, 0 0.010, and we don't have any sulfate ions. Now, to make it clear that this is not a regular solubility, which I've been using X, I'm going to use a Y here for my variable, but you can use any variable you want. The important thing is that sulfate can't be zero, it will increase. So barium will be 0 0.010 plus this Y, and sulfate will just be equal to Y. You can take those equilibrium concentrations and set them equal to the KSP, the 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10th. So 0 0.010 plus Y will be barium, Y will be sulfate, and all of that equals KSP 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10th. This is a quadratic formula as written. You'd have y squared plus 0 0.010 zero y uh, minus ksp equals zero, and you could go from there and figure that out. However, in pure water, the little y value was 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5, a small number, especially when compared to 0 0.010. And in the barium solution, by Le Chatelier's principle, we expect the value, the 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5, to be even smaller. Barium ions are shifting the equilibrium to the reactant side, so y should be an even smaller value. So for all of those reasons, Reasons, it's absolutely okay to ignore that plus y. And that makes, again, your math a lot easier. KSP equals 0 0.010 times y. And if you solve for y, that just is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 10 divided by 0 0.010. 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8 moles per liter. Now, this number is the solubility. It's how much barium sulfate is breaking down to ions, but in the presence of the barium. And that's a number smaller than the 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5 number that you saw for pure water. The barium ions, barium ions are common to the KSP equilibria. The barium is making the solubility decrease, all right? The solubility value there is less than the 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. Barium made the solubility go down. So if you don't want your barium sulfate to break down, you can add a little barium to it. That'll keep the solubility much, much smaller. So to summarize, the solubility of barium sulfate in pure water, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. In the presence of the barium, though, the solubility went down 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8th. And again, Le Chatelet's principle came through for us once again. We added barium ions, which was a product. If you add something, it's going to move to the opposite side, move to the reactant side. That means that we should have less barium and sulfate dissolved. Uh, in the presence of the excess barium. And that's what we're seeing here mathematically. It went from a 10 to the minus 5 molarity solubility down to 10 to the minus 8. So that's a pretty good jump down there. So again, Le Chatelier's principle is followed. Woohoo! Good for Le Chatelier. Ah, getting too excited.